reports uh, to police, uh, like the dog fighting crimes, aren't often prosecuted. And you don't often see people go to jail for making these false reports. This is a nonviolent crime, mm. if he did, in fact, commit it. You know, this isn't yep. a crime where anyone was actually harmed other than the resources that were utilized right. and the... You know, we talk Arriva, about the black eye. Arriva, sorry to, sorry to interrupt. We do see the press conference beginning here. Uh, let, let's have a listen. Good morning, everyone. Before I get started on why we're here, you know, as I look out into the crowd, I just wish that the families of gun violence in this city got this much attention because that's who really deserves the amount of attention that we're giving to this particular incident. So this morning, I come to you not only as the superintendent of the Chicago Police Department, but also as a black man who spent his entire life living in the city of Chicago. I know the racial divide that exists here. I know how hard it's been for our city and our nation to come together. And I also know the disparities and I know the history. This announcement today recognizes that Empire actor Jesse Smollett took advantage of the pain and anger of racism to promote his career. I'm left hanging my head and asking why. Why would anyone, especially an African American man, use the symbolism of a noose to make false accusations. How could someone look at the hatred and suffering associated with that symbol and see an opportunity to manipulate that symbol to further his own public profile? How can an individual who's been embraced by the city of Chicago turn around and slap everyone in this city in the face by making these false claims? Bogus police reports cause real harm. They do harm to every legitimate victim who's in need of support by police and, and investigators as well as the citizens of this city. Chicago hosts one of the largest pride parades in the world and we're proud of that as a police department and also as a city. We do not nor will we ever tolerate hate in our city whether that hate is based on an individual's sexual orientation, race, or anything else. So I'm offended by what's happened, and I'm also angry. I love the city of Chicago and the Chicago Police Department, warts and all. But this publicity stunt was a scar that Chicago didn't earn and certainly didn't deserve. To make things worse, the accusations within this phony attack received national attention for weeks. Celebrities, news commentators, and even presidential candidates weighed in on something that was choreographed by an actor. First, Smollett attempted to gain attention by sending a false letter that relied on racial, homophobic, and political language. When that didn't work, Smollett paid $3,500 to stage this attack and drag Chicago's reputation through the mud in the process. And why? This stunt was orchestrated by Smollett because he was dissatisfied with his salary. So he concocted a story about being attacked. Now our city has problems, we know that. We have problems that have affected people from all walks of life, and we know that. But to put the national spotlight on Chicago for something that is both egregious and untrue is simply shameful. I'm also concerned about what this means moving forward for hate crimes. Now, of course, the Chicago Police Department will continue to investigate all reports of these types of incidents with the same amount of vigor that we did with this one. But my concern is that hate crimes will now publicly be met with a level of skepticism that previously didn't, occur, didn't happen. That said, Smollett was treated as a victim throughout this investigation until we received evidence that led detectives in another direction. I couldn't be more proud 
of the unrelenting detective work that went into this investigation, and I couldn't be more proud of every investigator that played a part in it. The detective work that we saw in this case is indicative of the work that our detectives do every day in this city. This case in particular involved hours of video evidence, which when combined with old-fashioned police work, uncovered the truth. These detectives deserve all the credit in the world for carefully analyzing the leads and the evidence for weeks before coming to their conclusion. I'd also like to thank the FBI for their help in this investigation. The FBI's partnership with CPD has been pivotal in this particular case. I only hope that the truth about what happened receives the same amount of attention that the hoax did. I'll continue to pray for this troubled young man who resorted to both drastic and illegal tactics to gain attention. I'll also continue to pray for our city, asking that we can move forward from this and begin to heal. And now I'd like to call up Commander Edward Watnicki, who personally led this patient and deliberate investigation to walk everyone through how the Chicago Police Department arrived at this point. Good morning, everyone. My name is Edward Wadnicki. I'm the commander of the Area Central Detective Division. I'm here to answer questions. Okay, the, bo the boss just corrected me. Give, give, please forgive me. I, I, I'm supposed to go through the timeline of our investigation. It's okay. <laughs> so, so here's where we are. Um, as you all know, on the early morning of February 29th at 2 o'clock in the morning, Jesse Smollett reported that he was the victim of a hate crime. Uh, detectives responded to the incident and, and interviewed him eventually at Northwestern Hospital, where he reported to us that, that uh, the, the uh, two, two uh, offenders yelled racial and homophobic and political uh, uh, statements at him and beat him, put a noose around his neck, and threw bleach on him, and then fled from the area. Um, we learned at the time that, uh, that uh, Jesse was not hurt other than scratches on his face, maybe some bruising, but no broken ribs or serious injuries. So we started a, a full-scale investigation into this hate crime, a very serious crime uh, in, in, anywhere. Uh, we, we quickly found two persons of interest on video that, uh, that we believed were the likely offenders in this case. We initially put out a seeking to identify, and we got this out in a community alert. We then started searching the area for video cameras and witnesses that could help us with our investigation. Uh, during that time frame, we, we interviewed over 100 individuals in a canvas of the area and a follow-up canvas as our investigation expanded. We located approximately 35 of our Chicago Police pod cameras in the area and in the areas that we determined these two, uh, these two persons of interest fled. We additionally found over 20 private sector cameras, and uh, I, I got to say that that was, that was super useful in this investigation. The city came together to investigate and help the police with this crime. It was because of these pod cameras, our investment in, in, into technology in the city of Chicago, and the, the uh, great... Uh, uh, assistance from the community in giving us those other cameras that led us to a really solid timeline of where our two persons of interest went. So in short, we were able to track them initially, initially forward. So after the crime, we were able to see that they fled uh, in a particular direction and eventually got into a cab. Our investigators located that, that cab, interviewed the cab driver, got some video out of that cab, followed that cab using all of these uh, surveillance cameras that are located throughout the city, the pod cameras, 
to an area up on the north side where they abruptly stopped the cab, got out, and walked on foot. Again, the community came together to provide us with security fo footage from their private cameras. So at that point, we then started tracking these two persons of interest backwards, backwards to where they came from. So we, we followed them walking around and eventually back to where they had gotten out of a cab. So that was another individual that we had to interview and another individual where we sought video. We continued to track that cab back to the point where the cab was tracked down by our two persons of interest in a rideshare car. We then followed up on the rideshare and, and that was the lead that we needed in order to identify the two persons of interest. At that point, we had a, a real good timeline of where these two people went. We were able to put a name to both of these individuals, and it was at that time that we started, started looking at where they went uh, right, right, right after this event. We tracked them to going to O'Hare Airport and jumping on a flight to Nigeria. Our, our investigation led us to determine that they had purchased a round-trip ticket with them returning to Chicago on the 13th, so approximately two weeks after the, the incident. So that gave us a couple of weeks to try to continue to, to follow up on uh, any investigative lead, any, any investigative lead that would help us try to determine what happened in this incident. So while we were waiting for them to return, we executed, we executed over 50 search warrants and subpoenas, working with our partners in the state's attorney's office, uh, phone records, social media records, and records on individuals to help us illuminate the, the, the likely uh, facts that occurred in this event. So moving forward to the 13th, we had a team in place uh, working with the FBI, Customs, and, and our partners out at the airport. Airport police helped us uh, tremendously. And uh, we, we were able to locate and identify these two individuals, these two persons of interest, when they entered back into the country, into the country at Customs. Uh, we took them into custody. We read them their rights, and they both initially asked for an attorney. They were brought to Area Central Detective Headquarters so that we could, uh, we could process them. And it was at that time that their attorney showed up. I think you've all seen her on the news the last couple of days. Uh, she came to us, and, and uh, after speaking with these two people of interest, she said that something smelled fishy. She did not think that they were the offenders as were reported. She worked with us very, very closely to get to the point where she came to me and said, you really need to talk to these guys. I, I'm going to allow them to give you a video interview with us present, and we're going to have you hear their story. They are not offenders. They're victims. It was at that time that this investigation started to spin in, in a completely new direction. Uh, You've heard some of the statements that, that uh, their lawyer, Ms. Schmidt, has made, and, and it was at that time that we took the information that these two individuals provided to us, and we substantiated the timeline and the details that they gave to us in this interview. We were able to substantiate those things. We worked very, very closely with the state's attorney's office we had been working very, very closely with the state's attorney's office for over a week at that point, and it was, it was then on the 15th, Friday the 15th, after, after approximately 
47 hours uh, of them being in custody and hours of them meeting with us and telling us their story and documenting their story did we release them without charging and I classified them no longer as suspects or persons of interest and as witnesses. So as is typical with any investigation, one would typically lock uh, these witnesses into a grand jury statement. Monday was a holiday, the 18th. Tuesday was the first day that we could, we could uh, attempt to do that. So we scheduled, we scheduled a, a appointment with the grand jury, working again very closely with the state's attorney's office in this. And as you know, at the last minute, uh, uh, Jesse's lawyers called and said that they had uh, evidence to postpone the grand jury that they wanted to provide to us. It was at that time that they called us and I met uh, with them, with a team of our detectives, and uh, essentially they gave us no new information. So I reported that back to the state's attorney's office and it was at that time that we, we locked in both of these witnesses to the grand jury. They, I'm told they did, a, did an excellent job and then the state's attorney's office approved charges against Jesse for the class four disorderly conduct false police report. We met with, the, with Jesse's attorneys and we arranged for him to turn himself in and as you all know, he turned himself in at five o'clock this morning in the first district in Chicago. Today at 1.30, uh, Jesse will be going in front of a bond court judge and uh, the bond court hearing will be conducted at 26 in California. Say again? Well, it, it was uneventful. Uh, he showed up, of course, with his attorneys and a few other individuals, but it, it went smoothly. Superintendent Johnson, if you had enough evidence to just charge him, why take it to a grand jury? Because that's typically what we do. Once we, once we believe that witnesses are valuable witnesses and credible, then we take them to the grand jury to lock their testimonies in. Superintendent, can you make sure the motive a little more? I think uh, most of us are hearing for the first time. You said that he sent that false letter to himself, and you also said that he was dissatisfied with his salary. Did you get that information from the two brothers? Yes. Who were the subpoenas and search warrants issued against? Well, a, a number of individuals. You know, we served subpoenas and warrants, of course, on um, Mr. Smollett, um, his manager for phone records, uh, the two people of interest that we had. And so we still have quite a few search warrants and subpoenas out there that we're waiting so to come back. You talked, about the, you talked about the detectives and the amount of resources that went into this case. Can you quantify how many man hours went into this? How many detectives worked this case? And also, can you confirm if detectives working the case from the February 7th shooting of that one-year-old were pulled from that case to work this case? We didn't pull resources from any shootings or homicide investigations. The detectives that you see behind me basically work on different teams, uh, which include property crimes and things of that nature. Uh, we don't have the exact numbers yet, but let me, let me just tell you about this. Anytime a hate crime is reported in the city of Chicago, it gets the same attention. This didn't get any special attention. You all gave this more attention uh, specifically than we do. We give every hate crime in this city the same amount of vigor because there's no place for hatred in this city. And as I said in the very beginning, you know, I've lived in the city of Chicago my entire life. We just don't have any room for hatred in this city. And, and for somebody to use it for uh, personal gain, it's just, it's, it's shameful because what that does is take away the resources that we could be putting into other crimes. Do you think the brothers could be implicated vis-a-vis -vis the letter? Say again? Could the brothers be implicated for sending the letter in any sense? If the feds decide to look into that, would you have anything to say to the feds about the cooperation and whether or not you want them to pursue charges? That's the FBI's investigation, so uh, CPD doesn't comment on the FBI's for investigation. Um, told the media after the grand jury was finished that the current narrative that's out there about how much Jesse allegedly paid the brothers was incorrect. Can the police speak to what evidence they may have that, you know, Jesse orchestrated this attack, asked the brothers to carry out this attack, 
And was there any evidence of money payments to the brothers? Yeah, we have evidence. Of, we have the check that uh, he used to pay them. So the 3500 was for the two of them in total, and then 500 on upon return. So, so, so was, there, was there like an, a, quote, an attack on the street, or, or did it take place somewhere else? How did that work? No, it, it took place right there. Um, so of course it, it was staged. Uh, the, the brothers um, had on gloves during the staged attack where they, they punched him a little bit. But uh, as far as we can tell, the scratches and bruising that you saw on his face was most likely self-inflicted. So when you learned about the motive of this, how did you react when you learned about the motive of this? How, how did that hit you and all the detectives when you finally figured out what the motive was? It, so let me reiterate again. You know, you all heard me say consistently that we were treating Mr. Smollett like a victim, and we did. We might have had some, some peculiarities with the case, as we do with most cases. So it wasn't until the 47th hour of their 48 hour hold time that we could legally hold them in custody that it, that it took a change. Um, so we gave him the benefit of the doubt up until that 47th hour. But when we discovered the actual motive, quite frankly, it, it pissed everybody off, you know, because we have to invest valuable resources. A lot of the, what, what I want you all to really understand is when you all put things out there um, into the universe that's not actual facts, then it causes us to have to chase all that stuff down. Those are resources and time spent that we'll never get back, that we could utilize for another investigation. And let me be clear about something. The shootings and homicides in this city were not impacted at all by this particular investigation. And again, we give the same amount of resources to every hate crime that's reported. Sure. 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 Johnson, how many other people were involved in this? Was the attack purposely done out of camera? Uh, did they know where the cameras were? I think that they knew where that one camera was, but unfortunately it didn't capture the event. So I, I believe that Mr. Smollett wanted it on camera, but unfortunately that particular camera wasn't pointing in that direction. You, talking, you said that search warrants were executed on uh, Mr. Smollett's manager. Are, are the, is the Chicago Police Department looking at Mr. Smollett's manager? No, not at this time. Uh, Mr. Smollett said that he was on the phone with his manager at yes. the time. Was the manager, Brandon Moore, involved with this? Did he know it was a ruse? He was on the phone, but whether or not he knew it was a ruse, we can't speak to right now. So we're interviewing him? At some point, we'll, we'll talk to Super you. Yeah. At one point, when this case started getting pretty thick, people started pointing the finger at the police department. How did you take that when you saw people started talking negatively about the issues that were going on in the city? It was, it was upsetting, you know, and I want you all to realize this. So we've been working on this investigation for about three weeks. We've solved several shootings and homicides in that period of time. So we don't take away resources from violent crimes of that nature just because this person is a celebrity. Again, you all gave this a lot more attention than it probably deserves. So when you get the opportunity, the shooting victims and families in this city that are victims of those crimes, give them the same amount of attention. This shouldn't have garnered the attention that it did, but it did because of his celebrity status. Okay, you always allegedly in. practiced the hate crime before it actually happened. So if that was the case, why are they not being charged or in that situation, should they be charged? How are you guys figuring that out? So Mr. Smollett is the one that orchestrated this crime. Um, they became cooperating witnesses in the 47th hour of their 48 hour hold time. So now they are witnesses to what he did. So he has to be accountable for what he did. He orchestrated this. Does being accountable mean he should have to pay all the money back that was invested in this massive investigation? Well, I think that's a, that's a um, subject for another day. But of course, uh, it's because of what he did that we had to invest all these resources. Superintendent, did Kim Fox... Is he still maintaining his incident, his innocence? He hasn't made any statements at this time. Do you have text messages? No. Do you have text messages between... Uh, Kim Fox's decision to recuse herself affect uh, the speed in solving this case or bringing charges? No. Uh, Kim Fox and I, you know, look, I'm the police superintendent. She's Cook County State's attorney. So we talk almost every day about different cases. So the fact that she recused herself didn't impact the case at all. Did she drag her feet in any way? Say again? Did she drag her feet on this in any way? Listen, we, we have a great relationship with, with our federal partners. And we certainly need to have a good relationship with our state's attorney's office, which we did. So again, you all have to remember that the erroneous rumors and innuendo that was put out there in the beginning was just that. 
This investigation didn't turn in the direction of Mr. Smollett being a defendant until the 47th hour that we had those two individuals in custody. So one more hour, we would have had to let them go. We may not be here today. So the state's attorney didn't drag anything. We needed to put the case together. These things take time. This isn't TV. Okay? This is real life. So it takes time. Superintendent, there were a lot of leaks in this case. Was that intentional at all? Well, who's to say the leaks came from us? Just because there are leaks out there doesn't necessarily mean it came from CPD. You know, I heard uh, particular things that were out there that I knew was simply untrue. So it doesn't mean it came from the police department. Do you have text messages or other exchanges between the, the brothers and Jesse? We have the phone records that, that uh, clearly indicate that they talked to each other quite a bit before the incident, after the incident, and while they were out of the country. Jesse and, his, Jesse and the brothers, Jesse and the brothers, you mean, the phone record? Yes. That's what you're referring to. Yes. Do you know that Smollett tried to make contact or made contact with the brothers after the attack? You mean right after, like moments afterwards? attack or attempted to make contact with the brothers Yeah, I just said. So we know that they talked at least an hour or so before the attack an hour or so after the attack and then while they were out of the country. We, we know that they were talking. Do you know Jesse tried to recruit any other people to uh, stage this attack or were the brothers his first choice? I don't know if they were his first choice, but that's who ultimately did it. But we don't have any evidence to suggest that. Why did you say that the brothers might be victims in this? What did you mean by that? That the brothers might be victims? Yeah, Manipulated, or, or how would you describe them? I think that's what the commander said. Yeah, well, I, I, I think that uh, I think the fact that this was staged and that Jesse hired these two guys to stage this for his benefit and then spin this into a criminal investigation put put them uh, in a, in a really tough spot as well. Uh, to, to the point where where now they 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 were arrested for a hate crime, and only because of of just the incredible work by the entire team did we get to the point where we we're able to get the truth from them, and now we are where we are today. Commander, why, why, why did Smollett hire those two brothers? I mean, you describe like what, what their relationship was, like how close they were. Smollett was with those two brothers. Yeah. So. Uh, one of the brothers worked on Empire, so they, they had a, a relationship, an association. So he probably knew that um, he needed somebody with some bulk, and he knew them. They had a previous relationship, so that's probably the only reason he, he chose them. Sir, How quickly did you see Jesse's interview on uh, Good Morning America? Where, where, where? Good Morning America. Good morning. Yeah. Yes, ABC. Did you see, did you see the uh, interview on ABC? I didn't see the it, 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 I didn't see the entire thing. I saw a couple of parts of it, and and to be quite honest, um, it's it's shameful, you know, because it, it it painted this city that we all love and work hard in in a negative connotation, you know, to to insinuate and to stage a hate crime of that nature when he knew, as a celebrity, it would get a lot of attention. It's just despicable, you know. It it, it it makes you wonder what's going through someone's mind to do something like that. So yeah, I saw a couple of parts of it, and, and I was angered by it, to be quite honest. How quickly did you all know that this? Yeah. Well, you know what, that, that certainly helped and, and you know, their account information on that really pinpointed who they were, but uh, who's to say whether or not we would have or not? You yeah. know, these, these, let, me, let me tell you this, these individuals you see standing behind me, the detectives in Chicago, in my opinion, are probably some of the best detectives in this country. So I have no doubt that they would have gotten to the bottom of this, you know, um, uh-oh, is that... Okay. So how yeah, that's last call so before closing. So, so we after this crime was reported, did you all figure out or think that something doesn't add up? Well, to be perfectly honest, uh, from the very beginning, we had some, some, some questions about it. But as I said, we gave Mr. Smollett the benefit of the doubt all the way up until that 47th hour of the 48 hours we could hold those two individuals because we just didn't have 
the, the total package to support that it was a hoax. So when you heard me coming out saying we are treating him like a victim, that was the truth because at that time, that's what he was. And I think anybody that reports a crime deserves the, the Chicago Police Department to treat them in that fashion until we have solid evidence to, to pr prove otherwise. Super. Way in the back. The brothers were obviously by the check, but did they indicate anything else that made them do this, why they agreed to do it, what they thought the outcome would be? Well, you know what? They did it because of the financial aspect of it. Uh, now, whether or not they knew the whole thing would go the way that it did, and I can tell you all with 100% uh, certainty, the way that they carried this out, there was never a thought in their mind that we would be able to track them down. Because these detectives, they put in intense work and, and just great work. And I cannot say how incredibly proud I am of them for the work that they put into it. But that's just an example of the work that they do every day that just goes unreported because it doesn't get the media attention that this particular case got. But it was, it was financial gain. Superintendent, so the one people... Good morning, America investigation and that Jesse essentially identified who these brothers were. Well, he identified who those two individuals were. You know, we knew that then. He didn't know that we knew. But, um, yeah, he helped us out when he identified them. Okay. Um, so, did you identify the brothers specifically? Um, all of the videos today? When was it in the investigation when you realized that their names and who they were? Was it when you tracked them? That was after the, um, the ride share account, yes. Superintendent, okay. the one piece of evidence then just confirming that he wanted was not found on camera, the rough housing, the minor, no. the stage beating. It's not on camera anyway. That, that was the one piece. We have about, uh, I would say, about two hours of footage back and forth, and that, that those few minutes were not on. You met the police report on him? We don't know. Yeah. Okay. Thank you all. more detail about the 47th hour? Just to... Can you go into a little bit more detail about what it was in the 47th hour that... Well, that's at the 47th hour is when the two brothers decided, like the commander uh, reiterated, that uh, with the help of their lawyer, they decided to confess to the entirety of, of what the plot was. Okay. Eddie, Andre, so is there racism or discrimination? With the you, said, you, said you said you want Smollett to be held accountable. I'm curious, what kind of, what is justice in your eyes? Absolute justice would be an apology to this city that he smeared, um, admitting what he did, and then be man enough to, to offer what he should offer up in terms of all the resources that were put into this. Thank you all. That was just a scathing takedown of an alleged hate crime that turned out to be false. The Chicago superintendent of police there, with palpable anger, really, as he spoke, uh, calling this despicable, calling it shameful, uh, saying that Jesse Smollett took drastic and illegal tactics simply to gain attention, and because he wasn't satisfied with his salary, uh, rare that you see uniformed police officers be so direct uh, and, and so angry, frankly, uh, at a false crime. Uh, listen to his comments how the superintendent, Eddie Johnson, kicked off this remarkable press conference. This announcement today recognizes that Empire actor Jesse Smollett took advantage of the pain and anger of racism to promote his career. I'm left hanging my head and asking why. Why would anyone, especially an African-American man, use the symbolism of a noose to make false accusations. How could someone look at the hatred and suffering associated with that symbol and see an opportunity to manipulate that symbol to further his own public profile? How can an individual who's been embraced by the city of Chicago turn around and slap everyone in this city in the face by making these false claims? Bogus police reports cause real harm. They do harm to every legitimate victim who's in need of support by police and, and investigators as well as the citizens of this city. 
new details from the investigation too that they revealed there. I mean, this, this was fantastic police work. When you, when you go through how they substantiated this being a false uh, crime, a hundred interviews, more than a hundred interviews. They, they, they used 35 uh, state or government cameras, 25 private sector cameras to bring together hours of video to help document this, 50 search warrants. I mean, a remarkable case of police work. Let's bring in our experts, Ariva Martin, to you. What struck you the most? When we started the segment, my question was why? And for the first time, Poppy, we got an yeah. answer to that question. I think everyone that has been following this story so intensely has been trying to figure out why this young man would put his career at risk, why he would put the reputations and credibility of high-profile figures like presidential uh, you know, candidates, uh, celebrities, social justice activists, why would he put all of them in jeopardy. And for the first time, we heard this uh, superintendent of police tell us the reason that this was all about personal financial gain. This was about the Benjamins. This was about the money. Mm. And it is just unbelievable to me as I sit here listening to this press conference. And Jim, like you, I started writing down the adjectives used by the superintendent. And he is angry. In his own words, he's pissed off. Uh, and I concur with him. Racism is such an issue in this country, and so many people are on the front lines fighting to eradicate racism, to raise awareness about it, to fight back against hate crimes. And this kind of false accusation just sets that movement, those efforts back decades. So just shameful conduct if indeed the statements of this police department are 100 percent accurate. Ryan Young, you, you were there in the room. It, it struck us that, that uh, it wasn't clear whether Smollett has admitted guilt at this point. Uh, you, you saw the police superintendent there at the end said he wants an apology, he wants an admission, and he wants him to pay back the cost of this. Not clear, but, but on motive, uh, really a remarkable, a disturbing revelation. Well, absolutely. First things first here, I was told the motive maybe two or three days ago by a source. I didn't even feel comfortable repeating it because I never believed that's what they were going to come for it with. So the, the fact that he came out so strongly with it, in fact, listen to his words as he talked about the motive just a few minutes ago. Smollett attempted to gain attention by sending a false letter that relied on racial, homophobic, and political language. When that didn't work, Smollett paid $3,500 to stage this attack and drag Chicago's reputation through the mud in the process. And why? This stunt was orchestrated by Smollett because he was dissatisfied with his salary. So he concocted a story about being attacked. I think the rank and file and people in the city are going to be very happy with how strong the superintendent came across. I think the opening line talking about as a black man and living in the city and talking about the noose and how he used that and how it upset several members of the police department is something else that people are going to applaud because look, a lot of times people complain about our coverage in terms of Chicago because they think we paint too negative of a picture of a city. You're talking about a city where crime's trending downward, but all the time people try to make this city a punching bag to talk about crime. Well, in this neighborhood where this crime happened, there's not a lot of crime. And you see how the resources came together. And despite the fact that people were throwing arrows at the police department throughout all of this, why couldn't they get this faster? Why couldn't they do this? And you see the fact that a day later, they were able to develop suspects through these video images and then track this down bit by bit. And I'm told when the two men returned back from Nigeria, they were shocked when the police department was there to greet them at the airport to take them into custody. They never thought that was going to happen. So when you see this all unfold and how strong the superintendent was with this conversation, you understand what they're doing. And the fact that he asked for an apology, I was quite, quite shocked that he went as far as he did. But there are people who were really upset about all the hours that the police officers had to spend to investigate this case. Mm -hmm. uh, of course. Um, and, and, you know, Ryan, the way that he started, the superintendent, the commissioner there started the press conference, looking at how many of you journalists were there and the mm -hmm. live coverage across the nation, he said, I wish that the victims of gun violence in this city got the attention yeah. that this case is getting, Ryan. I I think that's so important because, look, we've covered stories before, and I remember there have been times where there have been 
innocent children shot on the south side of Chicago. And look, people can frame that however they want to politically, but not a lot of people go and cover some of these stories sometimes, especially with the national media. They only show up during the holidays. The fact that he's able to zero in on that and call everyone out at the same time by saying, look, we are going to be open. You want to cover these stories? Come and cover it. But the fact that the detectives are going out and they're facing some challenging circumstances sometimes, you can see that there's a tide that's shifting here in the city in terms of how they're looking at some of the gun violence in the city. They've got shot spotter technology all throughout it. But it's not sexy all the time to talk about a thousand people shot. It, it sounds like it's over and over again. But that's not what happened. He put it out on Front Street. And then the idea that someone who calls themselves an advocate would stand up and take those resources and challenge the community in a way that maybe shouldn't have happened. And then at some point, people were calling out the police department saying this was a racist organization. Well, imagine as a African-American superintendent police chief who's standing as the face of this police department, he's hearing all this constantly. The way he fought back today, I think a lot of the rank and file officers love to hear that because it is hard to do policing in big urban cities. There's not a, 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 solve, a way to solve crime very quickly, and you see how this is starting kind of un unfolding right in front of our eyes. Yeah. James Galliano, you had a whole bunch of years in law enforcement. You ever see a uniformed uh, police chief, superintendent, speak with that much emotion and anger, really? No, I haven't. And uh, Superintendent Eddie Johnson took this case personally. Mm. The Chicago Police Department took it personally. The, the city of Chicago took it personally. I was struck by a couple of things. The fact that he called him out for exploiting the racial divide in this, in this country and then putting the finer point on it by saying he was motivated by financial gain, something to help out his career. A couple of quick takeaways on this. The fact that the, the superintendent talked about he used the grand jury process here. There were a couple ways right. they could have gone about it. They could have filed a criminal complaint. They could have filed an information. They chose to use the grand jury process to lock witnesses into their testimony. The other piece about this I thought was interesting. I've never, to your point, seen a chronological rundown of a case like this. And it's because the case had such national you know, impact and import that the Chicago Police Department felt it was important to say, here's what we did. Here's how we got from point A to point B. Yeah. Start out as a victim. We never, ever, ever assumed that. We worked through it till we could disprove things he had said. That, that's a good point. And, and he reiterated it, the police superintendent, where he said that even as they were gathering this evidence, they, they started from the presumption that he was a victim and stuck with that throughout until they could pr prove in, in what appears to be a fairly tight case otherwise. Yeah. Well, you saw how the uh, superintendent also pointed out they're going to seek restitution for this. Mm. So think about it. Twelve detectives working essentially around the clock for two to three weeks on this. They're going to seek restitution. So not only is he facing three years, three years on a felony disorderly conduct charge, which is allegedly making a false statement, and then seeking the restitution for the resources that were diverted the wrong place. Mm. Ariva, how do you defend a client like this at this point? Yeah. I think the best thing, and I think we'll see this happen, Poppy, is that there have got to be conversations that are taking place between uh, Smollett's criminal defense attorneys and the prosecutors. I don't think he wants to continue this narrative. Uh, he's gone on national television and he gave that very, you know, passionate, uh, you know, statement about how he was attacked. Now that's all, you know, being unraveled. I think if he wants to work again in this town, if he wants to you know, have his career revived at some point, he's got to end the bleed. This drip drip that's happened over the last three weeks has been incredibly damaging to him. Now for this story to end with him being arrested, a mugshot of him, him having to appear later today in a bond hearing, uh, I think, and I'm sure he's getting counsel for, from some very fine attorneys, that the best thing for him to do is to try to plea this out uh, hopefully for his, you know, from his perspective, get some kind of probation or very short jail time, uh, make an offer of restitution because I agree with, uh, you know, James, there's going to be restitution on the table here and, and try to move past this. At some point, I know he can't issue a public apology now because the criminal proceedings are ongoing and his lawyers aren't going to allow him to make any kind of statement. But when the time is right and when it's appropriate, I do think he owes not only the city of Chicago, but everyone around yeah. the nation that came to his defense and those victims of hate crimes, those true victims of hate crimes uh, who don't get the kind of national attention that he gets, I think he owes all of them an apology as well. Mm. Wow. It's a sad story. It's sad. Very but sad. But if there's a, a silver lining, if that's the right thing to call it, it appears the police have come to the truth here. 
I think, the facts of this. I think our, our uh, immense thanks to the Chicago Police Department for what they've done over the last few weeks mm -hmm. on this. Thank you all for being with us for this remarkable breaking news. Absolutely. We're going to continue that coverage ahead.